Apparently, the president came out with a call to abolish chokeholds. The House did that. Seems to me that it's come time for us to move on from chokeholds. Better hiring and better firing. We're going to have a lot of input from police officers, particularly unions. A complaint can be lodged against any of us, an ethics complaint. We have a system here where we dispose of those complaints privately. I've had like seven or eight complaints filed against me uh, at the South Carolina Bar Association for different things I said during the Kavanaugh hearing and others. You know, I think they're a bunch of BS. The bottom line is that is a private endeavor. The question about filing complaints against police officers it would be so easy to ruin somebody's life as a cop and try to intimidate the police force. But there's got to be a way that you can understand that when the complaints are legitimate to take action, we have to be honest with ourselves and ask the question, is it too hard to, too hard to fire a cop? And when you have documented instances of acting outside the law, too much force, you don't have the right attitude to be a cop, how does that stay in your file to make sure that the town next door knows about it? Qualified immunity. Is it come time to revisit that? I don't think most cops want to go into the business if they can lose their house, if they make a mistake, but maybe there's something we can do with the concept of qualified immunity that would put more accountability into the agencies that run police departments. The one thing I can tell you that if you're subject to being sued, you act differently than if you're not. And we don't want to deter people from going into law enforcement, but we also want to have a sense of accountability. And to the extent that qualified immunity fosters a sense of, it's really not my problem, let's take a look at it. More accountability, more information, a national registry about how many people actually die in police custody, a national registry about the instances of using lethal force while in custody. The time has come to create a system to combat a broken system. Is policing an American systematically a racist inter enterprise? I'd like to think not, because I do believe most cops are far more good than bad. But when every black man in America believes that getting stopped by the cops is a traumatic experience, something happened somehow, somewhere. And I'd like to have a systematic approach to problems that continue to happen over and over again. So there are a lot of ideas coming from different corners of the political spectrum. The question for the committee, is it possible to find common ground? The answer is obviously yes, if we want to. As chairman, I would like to. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and thanks for holding this hearing today. It really is important. On May 25th, a Minneapolis police officer knelt on the neck of George Floyd for almost nine minutes. Mr. Floyd repeatedly said, I can't breathe. Bystanders begged the officer to stop, but he continued to choke Mr. Floyd until his body went limp, his life extinguished. Now, what was the unforgivable crime that led an officer, an officer, to kill this unarmed 46-year-old black man? He was suspected of using a counterfeit $20 bill to buy groceries during a global pandemic. Personally, this is beyond anything I can imagine, and I hope it is beyond anything you can imagine. George Floyd isn't the first unarmed black man 
or woman to be killed by police. The names are etched into this country's consciousness. Breonna Taylor, an emergency medical worker, shot eight times by Louisville, Kentucky police while asleep in her home. Eric Garner, choked to death by an NYPD officer for selling cigarettes. Freddie Gray, killed after being taken into custody by Baltimore police for possessing a knife. Walter Scott, shot in the back by North Charleston police after being stopped for a bad brake light. Stefan Clark, killed by Sacramento police in his grandmother's backyard for breaking windows. And Michael Brown, shot six times by Ferguson police while his hands were raised in the air. And just last weekend, the Atlanta police were called to respond to reports of a young man asleep in his car and blocking a fast food restaurant's drive through Even though the young man moved his car to a nearby space when asked by the police, the encounter ended when Rayshard Brooks was shot in the back twice as he ran away. I don't know how anyone can read these stories or see the videos and not conclude that something is radically wrong in this country. And we've got to move to stop this epidemic of deadly force against black Americans. I remember well the call to action in 2014 after Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri. President Obama convened a task force on 21st century policing. That task force provided a roadmap to reform law enforcement. Unfortunately, though, the task force recommendations have not been followed, and instead we have been largely abandoned under President Trump's watch. For example, on August 2017, <clears throat> the Trump administration lifted President Obama's ban on the transfer of certain military equipment to police departments. That ban was put in place by President Obama, consistent with the task force's finding that the use of military-style weapons and riot gear escalated tensions between police and the communities they serve. The Trump administration has similarly abandoned the use of pattern or practice investigations to identify and remedy systemic problems within police departments. Congress gave the Department of Justice authority to conduct pattern or practice investigations following the horrific police beating of Rodney King in my home state, California. And since then, most administrations have really used that tool effectively. The Obama administration, for example, opened 25 investigations into possible illegal patterns and practices within law enforcement agencies. Several of these investigations resulted actually in consent decrees that set out specific reforms designed to shift police culture and end systemic problems. Now, by contrast, according to public reporting, the Trump administration has opened just one narrow pattern and practice investigation that focuses on a single unit of the Springfield Police Department in Massachusetts. Remarkably, in the wake of George Floyd's death, Attorney General Barr has refused to open a pattern and practice investigation into the Minneapolis Police Department. How can that be? Anyone who has seen the video of George Floyd's last nine minutes of life has seen that none of the officers at the scene objected or intervened to help a man who was pleading for his life. And I think the video shows the truth in that. So enough is enough. Last week, Senator Booker and Harris introduced the Justice in Police Act. 
That's a bill that would implement many of the recommendations of the task force on 21st century policing, and it would require real accountability for police use of force. I want to commend them and thank them. And Mr. Chairman, I hope this committee will take that bill seriously. We can hold hearings, we can process it, and perhaps we can make some progress. This isn't a simple bill. It's quite comprehensive. It addresses tough issues and it makes notable changes. Let me just list a couple. It bans the use of chokeholds or carotid holds by law enforcement officers. It prohibits the use of racial profiling by police officers. In other words, ending police targeting of individuals for criminal investigation based on their race, ethnicity, or national origin, long overdue. It creates a police misconduct registry that would collect the disciplinary of termination history of officers so that po potential employers would be aware of an officer's past misconduct. It gives subpoena authority to the Justice Department to conduct these pattern or practice investigations, which would ensure that investigators could obtain all the information they need to conduct thorough investigations of systemic police misconduct. It also eliminates the defense of qualified immunity so that police officers are held accountable for misconduct. These are difficult issues, but they must be addressed. And I really want to congratulate both of my colleagues for putting this bill together and bringing it to us. Meaningful reform is long overdue, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to our careful evaluation of this bill over the coming weeks. So thank you, Senator Booker and Harris, as well as Representatives Bass and Nadler, for your leadership on this issue. Mr. Chairman, you and I spoke in the days after George Floyd's killing. I remember your saying that his death was horrific. That's actually the word you used. And said both of us were appalled at what we saw. And you were right. You also said this hearing, and hopefully more to follow, will explore better policing and racial discrimination regarding the use of force. I was so delighted when I heard you say that, and I'm delighted that you're beginning to carry that out, which is what I interpret this hearing to be. So I trust this will not be the committee's final word. Um, I hope we will be able to have Attorney General Barr before us. He has not agreed to come thus far, but among other things, the Attorney General needs to explain why the Justice Department appears to have ab abandoned practice or pattern, it, pattern or practice cases, and specifically why the department has declined to open a broader investigation into police misconduct within the Minneapolis Police Department following George Floyd's killing. Mr. Chairman, we have much to do. I don't think we can leave these happenings in abeyance without taking action, and so I trust we will do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my goal to reconcile these proposals to the extent possible and come up with solutions. Uh, Senator Booker. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you for allowing me uh, the courtesy of an opening statement, and thank you for your thoughtful comments at the top of this hearing. And I also want to thank uh, the, the ranking member for her thoughtful comments as well. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, departing from my prepared remarks, just want to say, what does it say about a nation where two senators from the same state have very different, wildly different experiences with law enforcement right here? In these last few weeks, I've had conversations with black folks who work for the Senate, people on both sides of the aisle, who all have their shares of stories of, of traumatizing experiences of feeling like they were one sudden move or one mistaken moment for experiencing violence. And the challenge is that this has been nothing new. Um, I think if we took the time to listen to each other, uh, we would see that we have a culture where so many parents have to teach their children to be afraid 
in order to be secure. I heard moving comments on the floor today about one of my colleagues who listened to their staffers where their kids were told by their parents to keep your receipts because you'll be accused of stolen things. I know from my own experiences, having guns drawn on me, being accused of stealing things. The challenge is, is that this often is unfair, it is unacceptable, it is wrong, but when it explodes like we see it, where people capture on videotape the kind of violence that you were, traumatizing <coughs> violence that you were gonna show. I'm really grateful for Senator Harris, who's been my partner over the last few weeks. Uh, and she and I did, as was said by the ranking member, work together with uh, congressional black caucus leaders and ultimately Chairman Nadler uh, to put together a bill uh, called the Justice and Policing Act. Uh, Act. Uh, we put it together, obviously, in the wake of George Floyd. We put it in the wake of not just black men, a black woman sleeping in her home, and the deaths that have brought to attention much of this in our national discourse, and indeed have brought in all 50 states literally thousands of protests of people of all backgrounds. I mean all backgrounds, not just race, religion, Republicans and Democrats who've been calling for an end, a meaningful reform. And yet, even in the days since Kamala and I put together our work with other members of this Senate, as well as people in the House, we continue to see things caught in videotape, as was said before, Rashard Brooks shot in the back. So we need to be very clear. What we're talking about is a nation that has two different justice systems, two different experiences with law enforcement that go all the way up to this body, if you stop and talk to the black people who work here, who have very personal stories, including Senator Tim Scott's eloquent exposition on the Senate floor, the unmitigated killing of unarmed black people in America by law enforcement, not to mention the disparate treatment, is something that we must do something about. We have a choice right now. Now, I'm about 51 years old, and since a little bit before my birth till now, there have been so many studies, so many commissions, from the Kerner Commission all the way up to the 21st Century uh, uh, t uh, Task Force on Policing, and nothing has changed. Cities from Ferguson to Minneapolis have done a lot of reforms. And as the data has shown, whether it's diversifying your police force, a lot of these things have been done before, but we still see the killing of unarmed African Americans. And so we really have a choice to make. And every day that we don't do something puts more and more of our fellow citizens in danger, not just of death, but of the kind of treatment we would never want our own family to face. We have a choice between us, before us. And so this idea that there is a Republican bill and a Democratic bill, we, we need to look beyond that for a second and simply understand that the things that are in the bill that Senator Harris and I worked on actually have wild popularity amongst Republicans. You hear Republican leaders from George Bush, his first address to Congress, said we should stop racially profiling Americans. That's not something radical. It's this idea that we're equal under the law. From chokeholds to no-knock warrants, things that would have saved lives, we have failed to do in this country by making them the law of the land, setting standards for practices and policing that reflect our common values. Republicans and Democrats overwhelmingly support these kind of practices being banned in our country that are in our bill. They would save lives. Breonna Taylor would be alive today. Eric Garner could be alive today. But it's not just setting a standard. Accountability is having ways of measuring progress to those standards. We are a nation that doesn't even collect the data on how many people are shot by police. I ran a police department. I learned the hard way. Without data, there can be no accountability. Without measures. I played football. It's not the standard. It's got to be fast to be a wide receiver. If you have no way of measuring that, what good is the standard? Activists local leaders, the federal government, we all should have transparency into policing. Without that, no accountability. And finally, you said it yourself. Took note of what you said, Mr. Chairman, that unless there are real consequences when you fail to meet standards, where there's lawsuits, 
or federal action, criminal court, there are two aspects of this bill, changing a standard in the criminal courts, it's almost difficult, if not impossible, to meet the willfulness standard. That's common sense. And God, qualified immunity, I could start listing, and for sake of time, I won't, all the conservative organizations from the Cato Institute, from the remarks of Clarence Thomas, that support getting rid of qualified immunity. And so I worry in this moment, I really do, that we're going to repeat history, that this is the movie Groundhog Day. Because here we are again in a nightmare, not a comedy. That here we hear talks of, again, a so-called reform package. It's more studies, more nibbling around the edges, as opposed to acting boldly and doing the things that we actually know will hold police officers accountable for their conduct, which will set meaningful standards, will allow us as a federal government to enforce a law. This is not an overstatement or an overdramatization to say that the stakes right now are high. Will we meet this moment in history and actually do something real, or will we find ourselves back here again a year from now, three years from now, with mass protests in the streets by people of all different backgrounds demanding change? And so, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the truth is, I actually have faith in us as a country. I don't have faith we're going to get there on time, and justice delayed is justice yeah. denied. I, though, believe that there's going to be a time in America when we ban inhuman practices like chokeholds and religious profiling and, and, and no-knock entries. I believe there'll be a time in America where we don't treat mental health issues with police in prison. I believe there's going to be a time in America where a black woman is safe to sleep in her own bed, or a young man reaching for his cell phone won't get shot dead. I believe there will be a time in America when black parents, like mine, don't have to fear for the safety of their child who just got their driver's license. I believe there will be a time in America when we understand that public safety is not about simply the number of police on our streets, but about the number of people who no longer live in poverty or are safe to drink their water or don't have to deal with addiction in prison but can get treatment. There will be a time, I know, in this country. But if the arc of the moral universe is long and bends towards justice, we have to have the courage now to be the arc benders. The question is not, will we get there? The question is the time now. How many more people have to die in our streets to get us there? How many more people have to suffer the indignities that even our own colleagues have talked about in the United States Senate? I believe the time should be now for us to make bold change, or we will be back here again. These changes will happen, but they should not happen someday. This should be the day. This should be the time so that we can ensure that this nightmare ends in America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could I have one minute, please? Yes, you can. Yes. Uh, I want to point out how my state of Iowa is not waiting around for Congress to act. In an eight-day session since the death of Mr. Floyd, Governor Reynolds signed a bill that was unanimously passed by both houses. And why I'm so, somewhat uh, familiar with this is because my grandson, Speaker of the Iowa House, but it creates, uh, it brings additional accountability to Iowa's law enforcement officers by creating stronger restrictions on the use of chokeholds by law enforcement officers, improving law enforcement decertification process to ensure that those who have been fired or resigned after serious misconduct do not work in our state, strengthen the authority of the Iowa Attorney General to prosecute officers whose actions result in death of another, and establishing an annual anti-bias and de-escalation training requirements for officers. I yield. Thank you. Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Feinstein, uh, for holding this hearing and uh, for the sincerity with which you have approached the subject. And um, I thank all of our colleagues for what I do believe to be a meaningful discussion with a real commitment to do the work of this committee, which is to do the work of supporting the concepts of justice in America, which include equal under the law, meaning all people will be treated equally by our laws, and we will enforce our laws equally. So I want to thank the entire committee. I want to thank Senator Booker um, for the courage that you always have to speak truth and 
um, your willingness to tell the personal stories. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. And you do that not because it is easy, but because you know it needs to be done. And I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, people from every age, gender, race, and religion have been coming together for weeks to protest injustice against black people in America. We have a duty as United States Senators to be fully aware of our country's history of systemic racism and a responsibility to take serious action toward achieving America's founding ideal of equal justice under law. When we say that America has a history of systemic racism, we mean that from slavery, Jim Crow laws, lynchings, and policing, our institutions have done violence to black Americans. And it has caused black Americans to be treated as less than human across time, place, and institution. Let's be clear about what it would mean then to transform our society and eliminate systemic racism. When we truly achieve that ideal, we won't have an unarmed black man, George Floyd, die from a police officer kneeling on his neck for almost eight minutes and 48 seconds, actually exactly eight minutes and 48 seconds. When we achieve that ideal, it won't mean that we'll have a woman Brianna Taylor, shot and killed by police officers while she's asleep in her own bed. We won't have an unarmed black man, Ahmaud Arbery, lynched while going for a run in his own neighborhood. And as George Floyd's brother, Philonese, said last week in his powerful testimony before the House Judiciary Committee, when we eliminate systemic racism, it will be clear to everyone that the life of a black man is worth more than an allegedly counterfeit $20 bill. Mr. Chairman, there is a movement being led by people who might appear from the outside to have little in common, who are marching together to demand an end to the black blood that is staining the sidewalks of our country. They are marching together to move us close and closer at least to justice. And that gives me hope. It truly gives me hope when I look at who is out there and the commonality of purpose and the unity that they are exhibiting. But we have to recognize that to, to deal with systemic inequity in our system, it's not just a policing issue. Inequities are also deeply rooted in our education system, in our housing system, in our workforces, in our health care delivery system, and more. And we must fully value black life, invest in black communities, and root out inequity wherever it lives. That means that across the nation we must reimagine what public safety looks like. The status quo thinking that more police creates more safety is wrong. It's wrong. And it has motivated too much of municipal budgets and the thinking of policymakers and has distracted them from what truly will be the smartest use of resources to achieve safety in communities, which is to invest in the health of those communities, and healthy communities without any doubt are safe communities. So we must ask our mayors and local leaders to re-examine their priorities and their budgets. We must ask why so much money is being spent to militarize the police, while two-thirds of public school teachers in America today are coming out of their own back pockets to help pay for school supplies in our public schools. It's time for us to realize this is not just a moment, but a movement. This committee and our entire federal government have a role to play in holding the police accountable when they break the rules and break the law. And we must be on the right side of history as a committee.
We can start to meet the demands of this movement by passing the Justice and Policing Act. And here are a few specific ways. First, we need a national use of standard, a use of force standard. Today, most officers around the country, the standard is to ask if they, if they use excessive force, the standard is to ask, was that use of force reasonable? A much more fair and just question to ask is, was that use of force necessary? We need a national use of force standard. Second, as a former prosecutor, I know that independent investigations into police misconduct are imperative. No matter how well-intentioned a district attorney or a state's attorney, when called upon to investigate the misconduct of a police officer that works in the department they closely work with every day, there will at the very least be an appearance of conflict, if not actual conflict. To do justice in our country is to actually do justice and to have the confidence of the public that there is an appearance of justice. These values are equal. Third, we need truth and transparency. Cities and states have to report police use of force incidents to the federal government. When I was Attorney General of California, I created an open data initiative we named Open Justice, a first of its kind open data initiative to give the people access to information about arrests, bookings, and deaths in custody. The public has a right to know what has happened and what is happening in their communities. And the public can then use that data to help hold us accountable. Instead of requiring that they are always presenting anecdotal information fueled by personal experiences. When the data is available, but we as government possess it, is it not the right and equitable thing to do to share that data which we as government possess with the public so they can grade and judge us appropriately? And lastly, we need to expand pattern and practice investigations into police departments and give state attorneys general the authority to bring these investigations. As Attorney General of California, I activated civil pattern and practice investigations into police departments. And recall, as Senator Feinstein mentioned, Congress gave the Department of Justice authority to conduct pattern and practice investigations in the aftermath of Rodney King's killing by police officers or beating, excuse me, by police officers. This power is des designed to root out systemic problems in police departments. And under the Trump administration, sadly, pattern and practice investigations have slowed virtually to a stop. They need to start these investigations again with an additional tool of subpoena power. And on this point, Attorney General Barr should be here today. He should be here to answer for his shameful record investigating civil rights violations in police departments in America. During the Trump administration, the United States Department of Justice has confirmed only one pattern and practice investigation compared to 25 brought during the Obama administration. He should be here to answer for reportedly calling for the forcible removal of peaceful demonstrators who were gathered in front of the White House to protest the murder of George Floyd. And he should be here to answer for his lack of leadership at this critical moment in our nation's history. Today, President Trump issued an executive order calling for accreditation standards for police departments, data sharing on police officers who use excessive force, and federal funding to help police respond to the homeless and mentally ill. Let me be clear, this is not enough. It does not meet this moment. This is not enough. There are thousands of people marching in the streets in 50 states demanding meaningful change. The people are demanding action. They are not marching in the streets for watered down proposals that won't hold any officers accountable. And there is nothing about what the president announced today that would hold police officers who break the rules and break the law accountable. 
The only way to meaningfully access police brutality is through comprehensive reforms, including reforms to hold bad officers accountable for misconduct. The Justice and Policing Act is certainly not the end, but the beginning of establishing national standards and accountability for police departments. And at a certain point, we've seen enough. We've had enough commissions. We have studied these issues. We have convened opinion leaders. We have talked about these in private conversations and in public conversations. Now is time to act. The people are demanding it. And they have a right to know that their government, a representative government of the people, will respond to their needs for us as a country to live up to our ideals. So in closing, I'll just say that, you know, we know um, that we have these words across the street at the United States Supreme Court etched into that beautiful marble building, equal justice under law. But we have to show America what it means and that it truly means equal justice for all. We have to show America that. And passing the Justice and Policing Act would be a step toward realizing that goal. Because colleagues, please understand, please understand, tonight and every night, there are black parents in America and grandparents who will be on their knees praying that their sons and daughters will be safe every night in America. We have to take this on, embracing what no doubt are difficult and uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable facts and an uncomfortable history about our country. But we must take this on, understanding this is a righteous demand that we fix this system and that we act. I thank you, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, our first panel is Dr. Philip Goff, uh, Franklin A. Thomas Professor in Policing Equity. Uh, he'll be by video. Professor Doug Logan, President and Professor of Urban Ministry. The Honorable Melvin Carter, who I'll let Senator Klobuchar introduce in a minute, is on video. Mr. Lee Merritt, attorney uh, of the Merritt Law Firm from Philadelphia. Ms. Vanta Gupta, president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Senator Klobuchar, would you like to say anything about? I would. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein, for this hearing. Thank you to uh, my friend, Senator Booker, Senator Harris, uh, for leading this important bill. Uh, before I get to introducing the mayor, um, I want to note that this murder happened in my state. And George Floyd should be alive today, but he isn't. His life evaporated before our eyes, before the eyes of the world. Our nation has been left in pain. My state has been left in pain, grieving, marching, and demanding justice. This is not a time to just talk about it. If we are silent, we are complicit. If we stand there and demand dominance and wave Bibles, we're no better than monsters. But if we act and we actually do something and get this bill passed, well, then we're lawmakers. And that will be the legacy of George Floyd. So Melvin Carter is the mayor, uh, the first African mayor American mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. He represents the best of our state, and like so many black leaders across the country, he has rose to this occasion. He is a fourth
introduce him to this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goff, you'll lead us off. He's not here. Is Mr. Goff available? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Um, thank you, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Good afternoon. It is my honor to appear before this committee to provide testimony on police use of force and community relations. Um, you have my full background in my written statement, but for brevity, um, I'm a behavioral scientist by training. I'm also the inaugural Franklin A. Thomas Professor in Policing Equity at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, but I'm likely best known in police reform circles um, for my work as co-founder and CEO of the Center for Policing Equity, which is the largest research and action organization focused on equity and policing. My testimony today is in that capacity. Center for Policing Equity maintains the National Science Foundation funded National Justice Database, which we understand is the largest collection of police behavioral data in the world. Our work focuses on combining police behavioral data with psychological survey data and data from the US Census to estimate not just racial disparities in police outcomes, such as stops and use of force, but the portion of those disparities for which law enforcement are actually responsible and can therefore change. Before I speak specifically about policing, however, I feel compelled to say that what we have seen on the streets of the United States over the recent weeks has been larger than the killing of George Floyd that sparked collective and righteous outrage and is still tearing up the fabric of our democracy. What we are seeing on the streets in the United States is a past due notice for the unpaid debts owed to black people for 400 plus years. And if the response to this moment as a nation is not proportional to that debt, we will continue to pay it with interest again and again and again. Turning to the complex issue of police reform, I want to spend a moment focusing on what science says about bias in policing. First, there is no doubt that Black, Native, and Latinx people have more contact with law enforcement than do white people in this country. There's also relative agreement that where there are fewer, uh, fewer public services, like drug treatment, mental health clinics, job training, even parks, law enforcement has more contact with residents. We also know a bit about how race shapes contact with police from the science. This comes to us primarily from two methods of study, so-called hit rate analyses and regression analyses are the two. Hit rate analyses or yield analyses reveal the percentage of searches that return contraband such as drugs or gun. If the percentage that is yielded is lower for one group than another, the common inference among scientists is that officers are stopping too many from the group that which is lower, usually black people, or that there's a lower threshold of suspicion for that group. This is suggestive of bias, though not conclusive. These types of analyses robustly reveal lower hit rates for blacks compared to whites across the United States. Regression analyses, um, in contrast, attempt to predict how much police activity, so stops or use of force, one can expect based on local demographics. In this way, it is possible to assess whether or not crime or poverty or other neighborhood factors are sufficient to explain racial disparities we observe in policing outcomes. This scientific literature demonstrates that neither crime nor poverty are sufficient to explain racial disparities in use of force. And in some limited geographic areas, it's not sufficient to explain racial disparities in stops. So in summary, there is evidence of racial bias in who is contacted by police and who is targeted for police force. However, it is also the case that clearly not all of the disparities we see are from police policy or behavior alone. I want to clarify, recent attempts to claim that racial bias in policing is a myth have been roundly denounced by serious social scientists, and there is currently a statement signed by more than 500 social scientists denouncing the public spread of this misinformation as being prepared for public release. I'd be happy to share with this body. So given this understanding of bias in policing, what are we to do? The most recent public debate is between institutional reform and defunding the police. And while there is no quantitative research literature on abolishing policing, there are reasons to believe that many within black communities are not fully aligned with this vision. Historical and polling research reveal that black communities do not favor eliminating law enforcement. They mostly want less biased and deadly law enforcement. Though it's important to note that given the degree to which public opinion is evolving on that issue, this too may change and quickly. But still, to the degree that a path forward involves using police budgets to invest in black communities, that process must be led by evidence. Evidence about what programs work, both in policing and in communities, and evidence about where cities can safely receive a higher return on their investment in community empowerment. As I mentioned at last week's House Judiciary hearing, the Center for Policing Equity supports the Leadership Conference Comprehensive Framework, 
and we will work with members of this body and others to ensure that it is, its proposals are ultimately enacted into law. Importantly, this framework enjoys more broad support than civil rights advocates and legislators alone. Many of our partners in law enforcement, chiefs who are experts in public safety, have steadily increased their support for the eight major pillars of this framework, with many chiefs now in full support of all eight pillars. While we hope that, number, that number will continue to grow, I'd like to mention briefly two of those pillars, which most law enforcement have supported uh, since the very need, beginning uh, of this conversation. We need to wrap it up. Okay. Go ahead. Very um, quickly. I'll just say that the, the, the ban on chokeholds is not just uh, air blocks, but uh, blood blocks. The registry also involves uh, broad support. And at a time when the nation is so divided, I hope that members of this body will take an opportunity to actually deliver something to the American people. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, Professor Logan. Hit your button there. There you go. See, I don't messed it up. <laughs> Chairman Graham and Ranking Member Feinstein, Senators, brothers, sisters, and friends, my name is Dr. Doug Logan Jr. I'm, I serve as the president of Grimke Seminary and former pastor of Epiphany Camden, um, Epiphany Fellowship in Camden, New Jersey. I serve now as a pastor in Richmond, Virginia, at a church called Remnant. I've been asked to talk about. Um, um, the policing and the use of force. And I come to you today not only as a black man, but also as a Christian clergyman who worked um, closely with um, Mayor Dana Red, my friend in the city of Camden, as um, I don't want to use the word defund, but I'll use revamp, reteam, and retool the police department for a more effective policing and a more effective police force in the city of Camden in 2012, 2013, and 2014. I have lived in inner city for most of my life. Many Americans wouldn't drive through my Camden block after dark or my Patterson block in North Jersey after dark. I speak as someone who has not only observed great injustice, but also experienced them firsthand because of the color of my skin. In spite of all that, however, I speak today not as someone who was filled with rage, but someone who was filled with hope. I am hopeful that we can recover some common ground in this country, starting with a renewed understanding of justice. I am, I must, it must be a vision of justice and equitable treatment of all people who are worthy of dignity, respect, and fairness, having been created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And it must be a vision of justice built on a commitment of all people and their government to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Anything less than this will not provide us with the common ground needed to strive for justice and more than name only, yet I am significantly hopeful. I'm a preacher, so I got three points. I pray that we would listen, I pray that we would learn, and then I pray after listening, learning, we would legislate. I pray that we would listen to the cries, the shouts, the screams of black and brown people and, and many white people that are screaming on the streets for a new day and a new way and real justice and policies to be put in place. I am hopeful that we can connect, reconnect such a vision of justice to our shared dream for a society that promises liberty and justice for all. It is clear from the cries in the streets that many of our nation's citizens do not feel they have equal access to these realities. In view of America's long history of racial injustice, that seems undoubtedly true. As a man who has grown up under the difficult circumstances of inner city America, I lived among what some would call the urban poor. I have been taught that racism is but one of the many problems facing impoverished minority communities, and anyone who blames everything just on racism, past or present, has failed to consider the complexities of those realities and frailties of the human soul. Yet I am hopeful. I am hopeful that we can restore the proper view of the police in our society and those who have been entrusted by and thus will be held accountable to God, the government, and the people. Theirs is entrusted stewardship, which comes with responsibility and greater accountability since they are permitted to use force to secure order and to keep the peace, yet without molesting or denying justice in the process. The police force is a necessary public servant to uphold justice in the midst of societal injustices 
and should be an agent upholding the good for all people. Towards this end, let us consider the best statistical data wherever it is available to fairly evaluate the rates of police misconduct against minorities. But let us also listen to the stories of the people from the minority communities who also, who almost invariably report statistically unqualifiable instances and bias. Simply put, the facts on the block aren't often recorded in any data. The cries of grandma, grandpa, and my friends and my cousins that we talk about in the barbershop often don't make it to statistical data we can do. So we've listened, we learned, now I pray that after listening and learning, then we'll legislate. We'll listen to the cry, listen to the pain, listen to the problems, and legislate. If we listen to the people and learn from our cities, I believe we can have comprehensive improvements. I pray for the day for my three um, biracial sons and my Puerto Rican grandkids that as I was given the talk and told to hold the wheel right and do whatever you have to do to get home. My father told me, do whatever you have to do to get home. The best time to argue with a cop who's mistreating you is, is a mile down the road while you're alive. So I pray that the talk I'll have with my grandkids and great grandkids won't be how to survive racist police, but it'll be the talk about in 2020 during a virus and riots that my country, the one I love, came up with wise and radical laws that made them safer. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend, very much. Uh, Mayor yeah. Carter, are you there, Mayor? Yes, I am. Okay. Chair Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, Minnesota Senators Klobuchar and Smith, and members of the Committee on the Judiciary, my name is Melvin Carter, and I serve as mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm honored to testify today in support of the justice of in police and. My family has been in St. Paul for over 100 years, since my great-grandparents to escape racial violence in the Deep South. My grandfather, Melvin Sr., was a Navy veteran who played his trumpet for four U.S. presidents. Working on the railroad, he was denied even the right to his own identity, as all Black men were called George to spare white passengers the hassle of learning their names. George Floyd's murder is so personal because every black teacher, electrician, and mayor knows that we are all George, and no matter no amount of money or accomplishments can change that fact. My father, Melvin Jr., served 28 years as a St. Paul officer and sergeant after a court order integrated our department. Because of that integration order, my friends and I grew up surrounded by superhero officers from our own neighborhood who knew us by name, were invested in our future, and who solved problems in ways that no one else could. Still, I grew up with a set of rules that did not apply to my white classmates. They could drive a piece of vehicle, visit the mall, or glance into a passing squad without fear of being stopped and questioned by police. I could not. Research shows that people Trust law enforcement will treat them fairly, are more likely to cooperate with officers, arrest, and step forward as a witness. Any of us distrust police, all of us are less safe. It's time we challenge the myth of public safety as a simple function of police, prisons, and prosecutors. We spend nearly $200 billion annually on law enforcement and corrections and maintain the highest imprisonment rate on the planet. Yet despite three decades of steady public safety spending increases, Americans feel less safe every year. The reason is clear. Our country's enforcement-heavy public safety strategies aren't designed to address the causes of crime, but the symptoms. We deserve more than a swift response after a crime is committed. We deserve investment to reduce the number of times we have to call police in the first place. And we deserve to know that our officers will protect and serve all of us. We've spent the last few years walking this talk in St. Paul. We've rewritten policies governing use of force in police dogs and terminated five officers who willfully failed to stop an assault in progress. We embedded social workers to respond with officers to individual crisis, employed restorative justice circles for nonviolent offenders, and focused capital investments to drive safety goals. Last year, we reduced our police department's authorized spring in favor of investment, in favor of evidence-based investments in youth, 
social supports, and a public health approach to violence prevention. Mayors are leading with reforms like these across the country, but we need your help. We fire problem officers only to see them shielded from accountability, reinstated through arbitration, and hired by agencies unaware of their past. We build trust with residents only to see those relationships damaged again and again by footage from other jurisdictions. With the Justice in Policing Act of 2020, we can establish a national standard of policing to curb brutality, end racial profiling, and eliminate qualified immunity. We can invest in community policing programs and alternatives for safety beyond policing. We can prevent officers from switching departments to avoid accountability and send a strong message to our children and to the world that America will no longer accept these cycles of violence against the black and brown. I know you will be pressured by powerful friends who will paint these reforms as hostile to police, but our work to restore confidence is a lifeline for officers who serve in good faith. When someone argues that these measures go too far, and they will, remember Officer Chauvin knelt on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. That's longer than my allotted time to make this state. To prevent that from happening to another we care about, no response would qualify as too much. Just as we grew up wanting to know where our parents stood in critical moments like Pearl Harbor and Freedom Summer, our children and grandchildren will, will call us to account for our actions now. Simply measuring the problems and offering incentives will not suffice. This moment demands decisive action. Like Emmett Till, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Philando Castillo, Amal, Donna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, and too many others, George Floyd commands the attention of the world because of the unacceptable conditions under which he died. The anger and unrest across our country will grow until we address the unacceptable conditions like homelessness, hunger, and police abuse, under which far too many Americans still live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Merritt. Senator Graham, other members of this honorable committee, we live in the deadliest police culture and most incarceration prone police culture in the modern world. Our criminal justice and legal system is as ravenous as it is racist. Our law enforcement community racks up thousands of civilian deaths each year. Tens of thousands more are brutalized, injured, and maimed. Millions more are arrested and jailed making the United States the single most incarcerated nation in the entire history of the world. This is an American crisis, a genocide. This is not hyperbole, but rather a reality that demands a national response. And I want to thank this committee for taking immediate, swift, and responsive action. I come before you today as a civil rights attorney, a practitioner. I am uh, the legal director for the Grassroots Law Project, and I represent families of citizens killed by police. Some of the names you know, far too many you have not heard. I represent the family of Ahmaud Arbery, who was murdered by a former police officer, Gregory McMichael, his son, Travis McMichael, and their neighbor, William Bryan. While I'm here to provide testimony about justice and policing, and Ahmaud Arbery was not killed in an officer-involved shooting, it was failures in policing that directly contributed to his death and the delay of justice to his family. Neighbors initially sought help for the black jogger that frequented their neighborhood that they considered suspicious from Officer Ronald Rash of the Glen County Police Department. He encouraged them to pursue a course of vigilantism. He was aware for months that these men were actively hunting a black suspect to whom they intended to do harm. Once the deed was done, it was law enforcement that lied to Wanda Cooper Jones, Ahmad's mother, telling her that her son had been killed in the course of a robbery by the homeowner. Local DAs, Jackie Johnson, George Barnhill, participated in the cover-up of his shooting. And the gun County police chief, where this crime occurred, was subsequently arrested on completely separate criminal corruption allegations, along with a handful of his top officials. Ahmad's story is not just tragic and unjust, it lays bare the need for a reimagining of police in America and their mission in our society. I run a practice dedicated exclusively to responding to police murders. I'm one of many attorneys that 
has this crisis at the root of their firm as this nation churns out enough bodies and human rights violations to keep us all occupied for a very long time. I continue, I continue to stand for the family of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin and other officers of the, of the Minneapolis Police Department held him down for eight minutes and 46 seconds under the unbearable weight of oppression. He could not breathe, and as the nation looked on in horror, we could not breathe. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellis and Minnesota, Minnesota's top law enforcement official preemptively declared that this would be a case difficult to prosecute. As hard as that is to accept, given the evidence we have now seen with our own eyes, it is consistent with the American experience. Because of existing laws that basically give carte blanche to law enforcement to kill at will with the utterance of these three words, I'm sorry, these five words I feared for my life, Hard-fought, rare prosecutions and difficult convictions have characterized the experiences of families like Botham Jean. He was killed in his apartment complex eating a bowl of ice cream. Uh, his killer, Amber Geiger, said that she was instructed, that she was trained, that if she, you can't see the suspect's hands, shoot him. A Tatiana Jefferson, also gunned down in her own home, after leaving the door open to catch a cool breeze of relief, from the heat of the night in Fort Worth, Texas. Fort Worth police officer Aaron Dean crept around the back curtilage of her home, saw her standing in the window and shot her through the bedroom as she played video games with her nephew. The beautiful families that I've traveled with represent a cross section of America. Disproportionately black, undeniably strong, relentlessly committed to the cause of justice and policing. They include the father of a young woman named Maggie Brooks, her father is a fire chief in Arlington, Texas. His daughter was accidentally shot by a police officer who recklessly shot at her six-month-old puppy, but struck Ms. Brooks instead, killing her. Qualified immunity has banned her family access to the court. Under the current federal laws, there will be no criminal or civil liability for this officer or his department. They include the family of Michael Dean, who went out to get his six-year-old daughter a birthday cake and never made it home. I wish I could tell you what happened to Michael Dean, but the video has still not been released by the department, although the officer has been indicted on manslaughter charges. This family has still not been allowed to see, see the body or dash cam evidence of what happened to their loved one. They have been denied access to these videos by the city of Temple, Texas, and Bell County District Attorney Henry Garza. Cameron Lamb of Kansas City, Missouri, was unarmed and shot in his, in his place of business and his home. The chief of police in Kansas City, Missouri, has broken with the local district attorney and refused to submit a probable cause affidavit in the case making prosecution very difficult. Jamil Roberson was a hero from Chicago. He was working as a security guard at a nightclub when the nation was hobbling from one mass shooting to another. A gunman entered his club and began shooting indiscriminately at patrons. Jamil sprang into action, disarming him, and he waited for police arrive, to arrive. When responding, Officer Ian Covey arrived and when told that the suspect was being held around the corner, he quickly went to the scene and shot Jamel Roberson in his back three times, killing him. There has been no accountability in that case. Antoine Rose was a 17-year-old, unarmed, when he ran from a traffic stop. If you could he, wrap it up, please. Thank you. Go I'm ahead. I'm sorry, looking at the clock, it says I have one. I'm sorry, am I over? All right, yeah, I, yeah. I, Yes, sir. That's all right. Just take your time. Wrap it up. Yes, sir. Antoine Rose was 17 when he ran from a traffic stop. The officer who killed him had just been sworn in the department that day after transferring from another uh, jurisdiction under concerns of racism and brutality. The question we must ask, we must be the generation to answer is, what are we going to do about all of this? Will future generations look back at this moment with pride? that we confronted our greatest e evils with real courage, or will they be disappointed? Because we had a moment to make change possible and fail. Right now, that answer still hangs in the balance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Gupta. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today on the need for transformative policing policies that promote accountability and respect the dignity of all people. And Senators Brooker and Harris, thank you so much for your leadership and for the Justice and Policing Act. While the recent murders of Rayshard Brooks, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd at the hands of police officers 
have once again put the issue of police brutality in the national spotlight. The outpouring of pain and anger is anything but a reaction to isolated incidents or the misconduct of a few bad apples. Instead, the outcry is a response to the long history of violence with impunity toward black people in our nation. And as law enforcement leaders themselves have acknowledged, from early slave patrols to the modern day criminalization of people of color, policing has involved the unjust, enforcement of unjust laws and helped maintain structural racism in too many communities in this country. We are now at a turning point and there really is no return to normal. We have to create a new way forward, one that truly transforms policing and leads to more accountability for communities. It is imperative that we get this right and that Congress's response in this moment appropriately reflects and acknowledges the important work of Black Lives Matter and the movement for black lives that has brought us to where we are today. My tenure as head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division began just two months after 18-year-old Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri by a police officer. And the Justice Department was hardly perfect, but we understood our mandate, which was to promote accountability and constitutional policing in order to build community trust. During the Obama administration, we opened 25 patterns or practice investigations to help realize greater structural and community-centered change, often at the request of police chiefs and mayors from around the country. And after making findings, we negotiated consent decrees with extensive stakeholder engagement to overhaul unlawful policing practices and develop sustainable mechanisms for accountability. Police departments around the country studied these consent decrees. They studied President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force report to advance best practices. That is not the Justice Department that we have today. Under both Attorneys General Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr, the department has abdicated its responsibility and abandoned the use of tools like pattern or practice investigations and consent decrees. The disruption of crucial work of the Civil Rights Division and throughout the Department of Justice to bring forth accountability and transparency in policing is deeply concerning. In the absence of federal leadership, the Leadership Conference Education Fund launched the New Era of Public Safety Initiative with a comprehensive guide to support local communities on police reform and building community police trust. While a lot of these changes have to happen at the state and local level, success is going to require leadership, support, and commitment of the federal government, including Congress. On June 1st, the Leadership Conference and more than 450 civil rights organizations sent a letter to Congress offering critical recommendations to move us forward on the path to true accountability. They included creating a national standard on the use of force, prohibiting racial profiling and requiring robust data collection banning the use of chokeholds and other maneuvers that cut off blood and oxygen, ending the militarization of policing, prohibiting the use of no-knock warrants, especially in drug cases, strengthening federal accountability systems and increasing the Justice Department's authority to prosecute officers under the color of law, creating a national police misconduct registry and ending qualified immunity. These comprehensive measures are reflected in the Justice and Policing Act. They are necessary for police accountability. Proposals for data collection, commissions, body cameras, these are insufficient responses to meet the moment that we find ourselves in, and more people will die. Where we have seen these kinds of nibbling at the edges policies implemented, we continue to grapple with police officers killing African Americans with impunity. Police accountability and the framework that our coalition outlined must be the cornerstone of any meaningful first steps towards transformation. Ultimately, however, this moment of reckoning really requires more than tinkering at the edges. It requires leaders together with communities from both parties to envision a new paradigm of public safety. That means not just changing policing practices and culture, but ultimately shrinking the footprint of the criminal legal system, including police in black and brown people's lives. And it means shifting our approach to public safety away from exclusive investments in criminalization and policing toward investments in economic opportunity, health, education, and other public benefits. I have heard police chiefs, police officers, bipartisan elected leaders, and communities that have all been giving voice to these issues. This approach not only furthers equity, but also constitutes effective policy. When we finally stop using criminal justice policy as social policy, we will make communities safer and prosperous. 
George Floyd's death has impacted the world, and now it is on us to change it. I look forward to working with you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Logan. Yes, sir, Chairman. Has it been the talk, for lack of a better word, if the police officer getting out of the car is African American or a woman, does it change the equation? I'm a little older. I'm, I'm closer to Senator Booker's age. I'm f almost 50 from Patterson, New Jersey, so. Well, that's not old here. Yeah. <laughs> I guess in my history, I was mainly growing up in New Jersey, I was pulled over mainly by white officers. So I, I imagine I was pulled over recently. Well, well, the point of the question is if, if, if policing is more like the community, do you think that helps the recruiting of minority officers and women? Yeah. I, Senator, I would say that in Camden, we had the officers walk around, talk to us, meet us, get to know us. And there was, it was a very diverse police force as we shifted to the county. And that meant a whole lot. That, do you think that means as much as hiring minority officers? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So yeah, those minority okay. officers were, I got were, were vital. It's um, how you do it as much as who you are. Amen. Okay. Amen. Because right. you could have a... You, I got you. you could I be, got you. Yeah. I know you're a preacher. I got to move on. <laughs> I don't know. All right. So... Uh, Mayor Carter, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have the same problems in St. Paul they have in Minneapolis? Um, Mr. Chair, I would with say... With policing, to, yeah. Mr. Chair, I would say to narrow uh, this issue down to one department or a few bad apples, as we recently heard uh, some folks on the national level I think would be to uh, misunderstand. Well, I mean, you're literally side by side. And my, my, my question, Mayor, is what have you done in St. Paul they haven't done in Minneapolis? Um, I, I wouldn't try to speak to Minneapolis. What I'd say is uh, we have been intentional to your last question about hiring our diverse uh, officers. Our last class of officers was 77% diverse. Uh, we have had, I think, strong and consistent leadership in our department. That's critical. Uh, but I would also tell you, we are not done uh, correcting this culture. It's work that our police chief is always focused on. It's work that we know that we have to do as a community together. And I think it's work that requires us to do this, to approach this as a national, at a national level, not just a department. Okay. Ms. Gupta, uh, during the eight years of President Obama, was there an effort to get rid of qualified immunity for police officers? There were conversations in many corners. I'm not talking about, about conversations. Was there any there was, legislation? There was not legislation. Was there any legislation to outlaw no-knock warrants? Uh, not to my knowledge. Was there any legislation created national registry for violent acts by the police? There were efforts to create the national registry, I mean, and all was of it, these things yeah. were included in the 21st century policing. Well, campaigns. I just missed a lot of that. So, you know, this is a tough time for the country. And um, Trump's a handful, but we're not here because of failings of one administration. We're here because of failing the society. And most of the things we want to do now could have been done eight years ago. So let's do the things now that make sense. Yes, sir. Let's do the things now that we should have done 50 years ago. Now, I came from, I come from South Carolina. Tim and I have completely different experiences with the cops. There is no getting around that. And it is now time to have an honest conversation about why is that? How can it be that if you're a United States Senator from South Carolina and you're black, you get stopped five or six times, and you're white, you never get stopped? How can it be that people die because of a $20 bill who are in custody not threatening anybody? And here's what I worry about the most. It is hard to be a cop. Let's make sure that we don't destroy the ability to be a cop in the process of trying to fix things that need to be fixed. Qualified immunity is an intriguing idea to me. I don't want the cop to lose their house, but I do want people to have to think twice if they've got a police force about how to organize it and how to train it. Because that's when change will happen. That's when people feel the sting of bad policies. 
So to the extent that any of you on this side, on my Democratic colleagues, want to get there, count me in. There are a bunch of us who would like to get there. And if we get there, it'll be together. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. And this will be the first of several hearings about what getting there looks like. Senator Feinstein. Chairman, um, it seems to me that the chokehold should be banned from detention use, except in certain life or death circumstances. And apparently a growing number of state and local law enforcement agencies are banning the use of chokeholds. For example, as I understand it, Los Angeles Police Department really recently directed its officers not to use chokeholds that restrict blood flow to the brain, also known as carotid restraints. So I think we should deal with it in this Justice and Policing Act. And um, I'd like to know each of your opinions. Um, if there were a ban, do you believe there should be any exception to this ban? For example, an exception where lethal force is being used against an officer or someone else? If not, why not? Could we go right down the row and have everybody answer that, please? Yes, I, I... Could you turn on your mic? I'm gonna figure that out today. All right. Yes, I would be absolutely um, for no more chokeholds. Um, I, I would lean into um, best, the best brains and the best minds on when Lethal force, I've been told that, you know, once there's uh, um, engagement between the person, between the citizen and the officer, um, that's where we get the challenge. So I would be opposed to chokehold okay. spirit. Could we go down the road and down the, the line and um, could someone respond to life or death circumstances as one exception to, please? Sure. Uh, Lee Merritt, I would be uh, obviously in favor of banning the chokehold, and the except for uh, when deadly force is authorized, is in fact authorized under the law, uh, and then it seems like that that would be an appropriate time to use uh, whatever means it takes uh, to survive the encounter, both for, from from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, however, I believe that of the myriad of ways that law enforcement engages in violence in this community, uh, we should really be focusing on changing the mission. Uh, in terms of whether or not these violent encounters should be taking place at all, whether law enforcement officers uh, should be engaged in a war on drugs, per se, that leads to repeated violent encounters. Thank you. Um, Senator, yeah, chokeholds are inherently dangerous maneuvers. They've been banned, as you noted, um, in jurisdictions including New York, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and Miami. And to Senator Graham's point, I do wish the Justice and Policing Act had been proposed several years ago. These are longstanding problems, uh, and the moment to make these fixes is now. Uh, next question, if I may. Uh, in a simple way for a non-lawyer audience, how does qualified immunity work? Why is it a problem? And what happens if Congress eliminates the defense of qualified immunity? If I may, qualified immunity essentially says that if an officer uh, in good faith believed that what he was doing was in line with his roles and responsibilities as a police officer, even if, if he reasonably believes that, even if it turns out factually to be wrong, uh, then he is immune not only from conviction, but he's Im immune from suit. Uh, there's no discovery. There's no uh, continuation of a, either a civil or a criminal process. So what do you believe there? What do I believe? Yes. Should that be changed? Right. So if, if you take the example of uh, the case I, I brought up during my opening, the case of Margarita Brooks, the officer in good faith thought he was shooting at a dog. Um, it was recklessly, uh, reckless behavior, something that he should not have been engaged in, but he thought that he was protecting himself from a six-month-old puppy that was charging at him. Uh, and in the process, he killed a woman. Should, should he or his department be... Uh, uh, Immune from suit? Absolutely not. Uh, he should be held accountable to his, for his, uh, his reckless behavior and the damage that it caused. Thank you. Next. 
Yes, I, I believe that th that's a part of the transparency and accountability um, and also prayerfully will serve as a deterrent and um, hold the officers at a higher accountability when there will be repercussions. If without that, then the culture comprehensively will have a feel of I can do what I want and I can get away with it. I would like to ask the panel quickly if you could reflect on the use of a no-knock warrant and the impact that that would have on communities of color, particularly those with strained relations with the police. Well, I, Brianna Taylor was killed pursuant to a no-knock warrant. She was asleep in her house. Um, there has been a lot of very high-profile uh, tragedies as a result of no-knock warrants are overused in drug cases in particular, uh, and their list is long, and I'd be happy to supply the committee with some of those cases, but it is time now to, to regulate them. Thank you. Please, sir. Yes, yes uh, no, we believe that no-knock warrants should be absolutely banned. There's a, there is a, a, a preference within the, 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 before the Supreme Court in favor of protecting citizens' rights in their home, the home being one of the most sacred places. The idea that a no-knock warrant, like in the case of Breonna Taylor, or the entry of the home of a Tatiana Jefferson, or the entry of the home of Botham Jean, or some of the other cases that I spoke about during my opening, uh, to allow law enforcement to violate a citizen's rights in that way, uh, when they are still yet suspects of a crime, people who have not been convicted of a crime, we don't believe that it, that would be ever appropriate. Thank you. Please, would, sir. And I would align myself with um, both my colleagues and say no, um, yes, no, no knock warrants. Um, it, it has a tone of guilty um, until proven innocent. And as a homeowner, as a father, as a husband, um, if I re respond wrong, I could be dead. Um, and Breonna Taylor is a testimony that we should ban no knock warrants. Thank you. Uh, Senator Grassley. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to first of all thank you, Chairman Graham, for the hearing. The murder of George Floyd by police officers, a police officer, ignited the call for uh, reform and measures to rectify a lingering racism that plagues our country. To Mr. Merritt here and to the Floyd family not here, please know that the grief and shock that we feel that it will uh, fuel action to prevent more tragic and unnecessary deaths. While the vast majority of law enforcement officers are public servants to deserve support and respect, George Floyd's murder uh, shows we're not nearly uh, doing enough to prevent abuse by police. I welcome tough conversation. I built a legislative and oversight career of rooting out instances where accountability is needed and where abuses must end. I led a, on the First Step Act to rectify shortcomings of our criminal justice system, which we know impacts disproportionately minority men and women. I investigated the 20, 2017 shooting of Bijan Gezer, uh, which re, uh, revealed instances of poor de-escalation tactics and inappropriate aggressive use of force. Uh, we must come together and address deadly use of force, racial biases, and uh, police abuse and do it now. My first question is to uh, Dr. Goff, and while he's coming on, I'll lead in with this. I've long supported efforts to increase transparency and accountability of all government actors. Uh, police officers are no different. That's why I've co-sponsored Senator Tim Scott's bill, which would increase transparency by the use of force, by requiring reports where there's been death or serious injur injury because uh, as a, uh, just a minority of uh, jurisdictions are reporting that. So my first question to you, sir, is uh, uh, I assume that this data would be helpful in understanding how to prevent unnecessary use of force. If you disagree with that, say so, but I assume that there might be. So if so, how can increased transparency into incidents of deadly or unnecessary use of force help protect members of the community as well as police officers? 
So thank you for the question, Senator Grassley. Um, your assumption is correct. If we collected those data nationally, that could be absolutely useful um, to preventing uh, those kinds of tragedies going forward. But just as important is collecting the information where deadly force could have been used, but wasn't. Because to do the right kind of analyses, what you need to know is a, a lot about the universe where force could be used. Those are the data that have been uh, historically missing, and that's part of the reason why the analyses have been so inconclusive. So I would, I would want to focus the committee's attention not just on what data are collected, but how we get the right kind of analyses, because the analyses are, are ultimately what's going to inform decision making. Okay. Thank you. Now uh, to Mayor Carter and also Dr. Goff. Uh, police officers should be seen not just as enforcers of the law, but as neighbors and members of the community. However, many cops don't live in the area they patrol, so uh, a natural divide and mistrust can form. To you two, I'll start with Mayor Carter. Uh, how can we encourage more engagement and trust between police officers and those they patrol? Senator Grassi, that's an important question and I really appreciate it. Uh, I heard a conversation earlier about what the officers look like. I think that's a part of the conversation. But much more importantly, I think what you're getting at is officers who are insulated into the community and know our community as well. It's not just about hiring an officer and getting to the point of understanding. It's about people who are a part of the community in the first place. My father always says if you know a community, if you know it very well, and you go to school, your children go to school there, you can come up with a whole lot of ways to the reasons not to shoot someone. Uh, and I think that's very important. We have a number of examples of ways that departments across the country are trying to identify people. We have the police explorers program, a law enforcement career at Brazen Academy that's designed to take young people out of our high schools out of our local neighborhoods and make police officers, more funding for things like that, more funding for incentives for officers of the community for help. Okay, and I'll yield after Dr. Yield. Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, I, did I interrupt him? Uh, Dr. Goff, uh, your answer, and then I'll have to yield to the next uh, questioner. No, so absolutely, um, it can be useful for the community to see, them, to see themselves reflected um, in their um, law enforcement uh, protectors. I would also say, though, the focus to the degree that we can keep there should be on law enforcement culture, not just on policies. Um, giving law enforcement the, uh, the tools to make sure that the people who advance and the people who get fired, the people who get hired, reflect the cultural values of protecting the community and investing in community empowerment and voice, rather than just sets of policies which may or may not get fired. Culture eat po eats policies for breakfast, and we would we do well to remember that as we uh, revise our interventions. Thank you. Senator Leahy. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate this hearing, but I especially appreciate the uh, testimony we've heard. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Gupta a question in an area that she's well familiar with. Uh, we've seen the proven track record uh, pattern of practice investigations, what, what it can do. But despite the proven track record of reducing police shootings, the Justice Department, the Trump Justice Department, has effectively abandoned pattern or practice investigations and the use of consent decrees. I think it was 14, if I'm correct, uh, consent decrees were enforced under the Obama administration. I don't believe a single one has been enforced under President Trump. So my question to you, Ms. Gupta, you are a former head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. How do pattern or practice investigation and consent decrees uh, make a difference in changing police practices? Well, the, um, the Justice Department, in a nation with 18,000 police departments, used this tool pretty judiciously, but would conduct an investigation after being made aware of uh, systemic problems in a police department. These investigations often were anywhere between six months to a year. Very deep investigations involving interviews with hundreds and hundreds of community residents, hundreds and hundreds of police officers, uh, police leadership, looking at all kinds of data, um, doing statistical analysis and the like, looking at training, accountability, supervision. And if their Justice Department made a finding of systemic uh, unconstitutional policing problems in a jurisdiction, uh, it would 
produce a report, make public the findings of this report, and begin to negotiate a consent decree. On rare occasions, it would involve um, litigation, but in most, in most instances, the jurisdiction, the city would settle and produce a far yielding document that would allow, because it would be filed with a federal judge, allow for politics to be taken out and long-term sustainable change over the course of whatever political administrations may come and go. Well, uh, and, it and, that's a, and that's the reason I asked the question. Uh, does it send a message if you don't use these uh, tools, if you have documented police uh, misconduct? Doesn't that say, well, we're just going to close our eye to it? Yeah, I think it has sent a very dangerous signal for the Justice Department mm -hmm. to have shut this work down. Um, I think it creates more of a culture of impunity in a sense that there isn't um, a kind of a, a, a watchdog agency that has been historically, through Republican and Democratic administrations, played a really important role in ensuring constitutional well, I, And the reason I ask the question, I, and I don't uh, think of Vermont as being a microcosm of the, of the country, but I've never heard such across the political spectrum the kind of concerns I've, I've heard is happening. And then in the hundreds and thousands of emails I get from around the country, uh, they, people say this movement is simply not going to go away after some time, as others have. I hope they're right. Uh, what would you tell members of Congress who think we can just wait and see? This waiting and seeing will mean more people will die. And, Thank I, you. and I think it will undermine any sense that our, we have a legal system that is legitimate and fair in people's eyes, and ultimately that undermines public safety. Well, I, I, I happen to agree with you. Uh, and it's, uh, we have to keep talking about it. I, I have a question for uh, Mr. Merritt on, um, you know, is it, with any other civil rights issue, legal protections against police brutality will only be meaningful if they can be enforced in a court of law. I, I'm a lawyer, I was a prosecutor, I was a trial lawyer. Uh, many who oppose making changes to the qualified immunity doctrine. Uh, and it's been pretty evident it's prevented victims of even horrific police brutality from getting redressed in court. They argue that it's going to open uh, excess litigation uh, and prosecution of police officers. How do you respond to that, uh, Mr. Merrick? First, 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 I'll say that um, we've done a review of case law in the area, and there are several officers uh, over a, a, an expansive period of time that have been granted qualified immunity for applying a need to, the, uh, to someone's um, body and, and, and them expiring during the, the course of that. In other words, Derek Chauvin is ripe to benefit from the protections of qualified immunity. In other words, using the need to kill somebody. That's, that's correct. So, okay. Stated plainly, using the need to kill somebody is the kind of thing that gets you qualified immunity in America. The scary thing is, the concern is that if you remove qualified immunity, you flood the courts with cases of officers killing people. Most nations don't kill that many people that that's a legitimate concern. Only in America is that a problem. So the, the answer, of course, to the question is stop killing so many people. Thank you. You, uh, <coughs> Thank you. you said what was on my mind. Right. I have other questions. Can I submit them for the Absolutely. Senator Cornyn. I thank all the witnesses. Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask um, the witnesses to tell us if they believe that the police department and the police in America are systemically racist. Does anybody, um, would anybody like to raise their hand in agreeing with that statement? Mr. Merritt? Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Professor, Professor Logan. Look, Mr. Professor Logan, I can't see that far away. I'm it's, sorry. It's all right. So we got two that think this is systemic, and that means all 18,000 police departments, all 800,000 law enforcement officers. Is that your is that your no. view? I think if you couch it in the system and not meet, I don't know all 18,000, but the system in and of itself uh, has systemic racism. I'm sorry if I may, Senator. The reason that I've observed that all police 
in America is, uh, is embroiled in a systematic racism is because their mission is bad. Um, we empower our police to go over police inner city communities, to go in there and find drugs and guns uh, and, and punish wrongdoers. The issue is the, the problems in the inner city community are blight or poverty or sickness or homelessness. Uh, those aren't situations that are necessarily remedied by a man with a gun. Uh, but rather the appropriate social workers, for example, or healthcare workers that would remedy the problem. Uh, when we over-concentrate our communities, with uh, black and brown communities specifically, with militarized policing, what you're going to have is disproportionate use of force and incarceration of black and brown people. Well, Mr. Merritt, to the extent that you are suggesting that we're asking our law enforcement officials to do more than just enforce the law to be social workers, mental health providers, and the like. I think uh, Chief, uh, Chief Brown, formerly of the Dallas Police Department, said we ask our police to do too much. And that, that's probably true in my view. A um, number of jurisdictions have, have um, experimented successfully with uh, a team, team approach, for example, to try to, try to re reduce or de-escalate the uh, confrontation when it comes to people with mental illness or, or, or the like. And uh, certainly, I think all of us see the benefit of de-escalation training. But um, to what extent is the problem that we have with uh, excessive use of force and, and lack of trust with the police a matter of class as opposed to race? In other words, it doesn't depend on the color of your skin, but whether you're poor or lack opportunities in our society. Senator Corden, in the United States of America, it's a little difficult to disentangle those two, and I don't think there's an institution in this country that isn't suffering from structural racism given our history. I think the goal of taking action in this moment is to recognize that there are things that Congress can do to end the killings in our streets, to provide law enforcement with greater training support, to make national standards on things that, frankly, should have been national standards years ago. Uh, this is the time to take action, given the pain on the streets and in communities. And this is just the reality of, of what communities have been experiencing. But there well, is Gupta, we don't, I don't have very long to ask questions. So let me ask you, you changed the, you changed the phrase from systemic to structural racism. What does that mean? That means every thing, every institution, every person in America is a racist? It means that there is bias built into existing institutions. And the policing, you, there have been any number of courageous police chiefs that have spoken to the history of um, systemic racism in policing as well. Do you, do you think systemic or structural racism can exist in a, uh, in a system that that in, uh, requires individual responsibility? Or do you think it's one or the other? I think every American institution has been kind of shaped by these forces, and our goal is to do what we can as policymakers, as advocates, to take that out and to provide and to try to fight it in the modern day iterations that it appears. Well, do you, do you believe that basically all Americans are racist? I think we all have implicit bias and racial bias. Yes, I do. Wow. And I think that we are an amazing country that strives to be better every single day. It's why I went to government to make a more perfect union. Well, I, you lost me when you uh, want to take the acts of a few misguided, perhaps um, malicious individuals and ascribe that to all Americans, not just our 800,000 police officers are 18,000 police departments. I think, uh, thank you for your answer. Somebody has their mic on. Could you please mute it from the remote locations, I think? Okay, Senator Durbin. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Let me respond to Senator Cornyn's question. Because I think what we find, Senator Cornyn, is that... I didn't ask you a question. Well, I think you asked them a question, which I would like to try to answer. If you take a look at our system of justice and start with the premise that when it comes to drug users, there's an equal percentage of white and black drug users. 
Now you look at the number arrested for the use of drugs, it turns out more blacks than whites. The number convicted, the number prosecuted, the number incarcerated, dramatically larger among the African American population. There's something built into our system that doesn't equate actual criminal conduct or criminal disposition towards the penalties that we assess. And I'm, my only suggestion is that could well be a function of, of poverty as opposed to color. How, how it starts, I'm not sure, but I can tell you at the end of the system, the result is the same. Can I mention two other issues, if I can, uh, that the chairman has raised, and I'd like for him to consider this. Back in the day, before I was elected to Congress, I was defending the sheriff of a rural county in Illinois, and he was being sued for the mistreatment of a prisoner in jail. How did I end up defending him? Not because I was the state's attorney, not because I was in public office, but because I worked for an insurance company. And it turned out that DeWitt County, Illinois, had an insurance policy that covered the sheriff. So when the sheriff was sued for wrongdoing as the sheriff, ultimately, the the county, DeWitt County, stepped in and indemnified him for any liability he might have. So it turns out, Mr. Chairman, that in 99 to 100% of these cases against the wrongdoing of an individual officer, there is an employer who steps in and provides an insurance policy and coverage that pays whatever is, is needs to be paid. And I will tell you, as a former trial lawyer, I didn't go after motorcycles of defendants. I was looking for their insurance policies. So it, it, I, I think the personal liability issue which you raised is covered by the fact that 99 to 100 percent of these cases involve insurance policies. But they never get to the question of liability because they can't get around the, the basic issue of qualified immunity. They can't match up on all fours conduct, misconduct, with something that's already been tried. Mr. Merritt, has that been your experience? That has. So uh, I would just answer your question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, those who are guilty of wrongdoing should be held on a civil basis for their wrongdoing. And no, it would not mean that their homes would be taken away from their wives in, in that regard. Can I ask this question, if I might? We've talked a lot about the conduct of those who are in law enforcement. And I recently had a roundtable last Friday in Chicago and a representative of the National Alliance of Mental Illness now, we all know that mental illness is part of this conversation. And what we found was kind of an eye-opener from the viewpoint of law enforcement officers. The, the highest uh, incidence of suicide among any profession in America are men and women in law enforcement. And they have five times as frequently PTSD and depression. It appears that there are some issues with their lifestyle, their job, the availability of weapons, the stress they go through that create a very vulnerable population among law enforcement officials. I believe we need to address, and why I'm happy to, to co-sponsor this legislation of Senators Booker and Harris and others, I believe we need to address that side of the equation. I believe there has been, uh, and we've seen it in videotape and, and proven it with DNA, there has been racism and unfairness in our administration of justice. But we also try to address, at least in parts of this bill, the training of those who are, are in law enforcement, to try to find those who are not stable, those who are not fair, those who are too biased, and those who shouldn't have a badge and a gun. Uh, and so let me just address that for, an issue, uh, for a moment. Ms. Gupta, would you like to address that issue? It strikes me that, that we've got to consider that aspect of it if we want a police force in the future that we can count on not to repeat what the sins of the past. Yeah, I mean, on these issues, the Justice Department consent decrees always had provisions on officer wellness and because uh, the mental health issues among police officers was a big, was a big, big consider, uh, concern around accountability issues, discipline issues, and the like. And that was built in into these consent decrees because they had to be taken seriously. And the other issue that you just mentioned around de-escalation, use of force, different training, bringing mental health teams in so that mental health professionals were paired with police officers when arriving on the scene with people in mental health crisis was another thing that was a really uh, common, common theme. But both of these issues around mental health and policing were really important. The last point I'll make is questions have been raised. Why, when the one officer with his knee on the neck of that poor man literally killing him was engaged in that conduct while he was, I believe he had shackled, he had cuffs on at some point, so he was no visible threat, 
what, what were the other three officers doing? Why wasn't there some attempt at intervention? And some have explained to me that because there is such there is a military structure to our police that uh, the chain of command makes peer intervention difficult, if not impossible. And I think we have to address that when we talk about policing in the future. Thank you. Senator Lee. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. We all know that um, about the brutal and senseless killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. There's no excuse, nor can there be, for what the police did to Mr. Floyd. His killers, fortunately, are being brought to justice. His death, we hope, will not be remembered uh, solely for being the, the senseless act of violence that falsely uh, was launched in his name, but, but rather hopefully uh, his memory will be uh, made permanent in our national consciousness in the long-term reform of policing policies across our country. In my home state of Utah, the city of Ogden is still mourning uh, over another death, that of police officer Nate Lyde. On May 28th, a woman called 911 saying that her husband was threatening her life. Lyde and a group of officers arrived promptly at the home. The man inside the home began shooting at them from inside. Lyde was mortally wounded. Officer Lyde was only 24 years old. He was about to celebrate his fifth wedding anniversary to his wife, Ashley. He had been on the job as a police officer for just 15 months. By all accounts, Officer Lyde did his job honorably and completely, very, up, uh, uh, very much uh, up until the moment he drew his last breath after being mortally wounded on the job. Nate Lyde was an officer who sought to uphold justice and protect the innocent, even making the ultimate sacrifice on behalf of a threatened and fearful family. Nate Lyde's loss really is our loss. It's a loss for everyone. Uh, George Floyd's loss is also our loss. It's a loss for everyone as well. And we ought to remember and revere them both. I think we can do precisely that. And uh, the residents of Ogden, Utah, are a good example of how that can happen. They came together for a peaceful protest in order to draw attention to both of these tragic deaths. Uh, this was a protest that ended and started peacefully and brought members of the Ogden community together rather than pulling them apart. So this is an important issue. It's one that we've got to continue to, to, uh, to focus on. Um, in, in 2012, in Camden, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey had the highest, uh, Camden, New Jersey had the highest rate of crime in the entire nation, as I understand it. In addition to rampant crime, the, the police department in Camden, New Jersey, discovered extensive corruption among the police force, with officers routinely planting evidence on suspects, fabricating reports, and in many circumstances, committing perjury. This behavior was so pervasive that a total of 88 convictions had to be reversed as a result of it. And as a result of this fallout, uh, the governor and the mayor uh, decided to disband the Camden, New Jersey police force and transferred the policing of the city over to the county. Now, notably, uh, the, the rebuilding of this new Metro Police Department moved forward without the involvement uh, of a number of people who had previously been involved in it, including the police union. Officers from the disbanded Camden Police Department were invited to apply for the new police force, and over 100 of them, um, a little less than half as far as we can tell, were eventually rehired. But as a result of this restructuring, uh, response times improved. Uh, did n now a person waiting for a, a, a police responder waits, I'm told, an average of 4.4 minutes instead of the previous average, which I'm told was over 60 minutes. Violent crimes in Camden have dropped 42% dropped in just seven years. All of this was, was done without a union. And in fact, all of this was done by freeing the department 
from a collective bargaining agreement that, as it's been explained to me, had previously locked uh, uh, the, the city and the city's police department into an unholy alliance with some officers who had violent and, in uh, many cases, lawless tendencies. And so it, this brought about what, by all outwardly observable metrics, uh, seemed to be uh, a better set of circumstances. So, uh, uh, Mr. Logan, I want to thank you for being here and for, um, for your healing words. I appreciate your account of the progress that's been made in Camden. And in, in your written testimony, you mentioned the difficult balance that has to be struck in order to empower police officers to do their difficult work, uh, while also holding accountable those who disregard the justice that they're entitled, that they're entrusted to uphold. In your view, did, did this restructuring that happened in Camden, um, ha, ha, tell me about how it, it helped to recalibrate that balance between power and authority that you mentioned. Um, thank you, Senator. I would say that they listened to the people from town hall meetings to conversations. Once what we're doing here, they begin to hear from regular residents. And um, I remember Governor Christie came to a hall near my house and had several clergymen and regular, just regular re residents um, speak into their struggles, their challenges, their fears, and the issues of Camden in its broken state. And um, Mayor Red just did a great job of hearing and almost re-saying to make sure that we were heard. And from that, um, as the new officers, again, the community policing, as they walk the streets, um, as a preacher, I'm good for a block party and an impromptu cookout. I never forget I was cooking on the corner and one of the officers, everybody called me Pastor Diddy. So he said, Pastor Diddy, man, I'm gonna go get some more hot dogs because we're out. This officer goes and gets hot dogs and comes back and he's electric sliding on the block. That would have never happened in Camden. That connection, that relationship now, if that officer was to pull over somebody, it changes the whole story. And so that accountability um, was a big, that relationship created the accountability that also was put in place because now um, a big thing that happened in Camden, we didn't know half the officials. So their faces were very visible and conversations were constantly happening. And therefore, and we had the, the baseball cards with the police officers. All those type of things bought, um, built into our connection, our relationship, which allowed for um, a level of trust. And um, in 10 seconds, I got pulled over in front of my house at a cookout, coming back with some more food. And one of the officers was talking a little rough to me. And I was at my house. And the other officer said something to the effect of, oh, you're the pastor, right? I said, yeah. And he sort of told the guy, calm down, he lives right here. It was that simple. I, I don't know if that story would have been the same in 06, in 07. And 2012 was rough. One of that, that key murder that broke, that was in December, was in front of my church building on Saturday night. And they still had the tape out when I showed up to church Sunday morning. And our congregation cried. I preached outside and prayed that God would change the city and he would use his church. And that we would preach Christ Jesus and things would change. And we had a good mayor who came to my church and visited a couple times and... I have family that live there now, and they are benefiting from a new police department. Thank Senator you. Lee, if you don't mind me adding briefly, um, if, if the rules allow. So I, have, I would be remiss not to mention this. I, I taught in Camden, New Jersey. It was my first job out of undergrad. I taught at Morehouse College. I will be very brief. One thing to Senator, uh, to Senator Graham's, Chairman Graham's point, was they made it a particular effort to uh, recruit from Camden. So one of my former students, Jimmy Mercado, is now a, a, a police officer in Camden. Uh, when he goes in, into some of the rougher neighborhoods, they know Jimmy, right, just like they knew Pastor here. And that, 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 that does make a, a difference to your point, Mr. Yeah, Graham. Uh, and I know we, you know, this committee is an interesting experience. I enjoy it. Nobody else does. I learn a lot. Uh, what percentage of the Camden police force was minority before their recon? 
I don't have those numbers. Deep. I don't have those numbers. I know after it was like 50, 50 some odd percent. I, I, I can't say that there are neighboring communities there, and the, the concern was that most people came from neighboring communities there that did not respect So it really is about Hispanic being population. from the community as much as anything else getting out and about. That's as important as the racial makeup of the police force. I believe so, Mr. Chairman. The only thing I would just want to add, Senators, there have been studies, though, about diversity in law enforcement. And, of course, it matters deeply for trust, but studies actually show that um, diversity does not impact use of force rates and misconduct in the way that one would anticipate. So it, um, it that's matters. What, that's for what I'm learning from this hearing. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all for being here for this hearing. For five Utah minutes. Okay. I want to take a uh, moment on Section 1983, which, as you know, is the primary vehicle for uh, assessing liability for police misconduct. Um, and as you also know, the primary defense against that liability, uh, and it's even a pretrial defense, is the defense of qualified immunity, which is the subject of um, the uh, Booker-Harris legislation. Now, qualified immunity, as I understand it, limits liability, narrows the window of conduct that, for which an officer can be held liable, and its original purpose um, was to protect the individual officer. Um, at the same time that it does that, however, it has the effect of depriving the injured or wronged person of their recovery. And also, it dulls the signal back into the agency that something is wrong because they got away with it because of qualified immunity. So as we've heard today, um, police officers are actually almost always indemnified by their departments. And it's interesting to think of it because the only way you get by qualified immunity is if you had a if, if, you, if a reasonable person would have known that what you did was unconstitutional. A reasonable that, police officer. Yeah. And that group of people who reasonably should have known that what they did was unconstitutional, they're the ones that are getting indemnified. That's right. So it's not like there's some like, bad cases where we don't indemnify and the good cases we do. Indemnification is the constant here, pretty much. And in addition to the study Senator Harris cited, there's another report that described the indemnification as occurring virtually always. So one wonders why should the department be obliged to pay? And it seems that there are a lot of obvious reasons. One, they set the policy that the officers follow. Two, they set the procedures that the officers follow. Three, they establish the training that the officers follow. Four, they direct, they dominate the culture that the officers follow, and finally, they provide the discipline that the officers must adhere to. They are the employers, in a, in a nutshell. So I look outside of the police cases to regular employer liability, and there you find an ancient doctrine, vicarious liability, respondeat superior, in which if you're acting within the scope of your employment, your employer owns it. That's right. And UPS drivers drive really safely because UPS knows they own those wrecks and they're going to make darn sure. A private company that is paying for security services is going to lean towards hiring bonded security professionals because they know that if they screw up, the company owns it. So the incentives are in the right place. So here is my worry and here's what I'd like you to uh, think about. We've got a couple of choices here. We can leave qualified immunity alone. I think that would be a terrible mistake. So that means we should strip out qualified immunity. Um, and then we can do one of two things. We can either just do that and hope that indemnity survives. But Mr. Merritt, as you said, there's going to be a flood of cases that qualified immunity defenses have kept out of the courtrooms. And Right now, indemnification of officers stands on a fairly rickety structure of a mix of policy, practice, municipal ordinance, state law. You agree with that? So far, yes, sir. Yeah, you've tried these cases. You know this. So if there's this surge of cases because we've stripped qualified immunity away, it seems to me that we also need to lock down 
where everybody is right now, which is indemnification. That officers are now virtually always indemnified after we've stripped away qualified immunity. They should stay indemnified. That vicarious liability, one of the oldest and most established doctrines in the law, would provide that, and that that would be a fairly sensible backstop to make sure that Chairman Graham is concerned that an officer who does something wrong doesn't lose his house, and to also meet all of our concern that the departments get behind the policies, the procedures, the training, the culture, and the discipline that will, to your point, Mr. Merritt, prevent these things from happening in the first place. So given those three choices, leave qualified immunity alone, strip out qualified immunity but don't touch indemnification, or strip out qualified indemnity and protect indemnification, make sure that officers remain indemnified, which would you recommend? I would recommend, I'm sorry, uh, protecting uh, or, or moving for, towards responding as superior, I'm sorry, which are three options. It's the, th the, it's third, the third option. option. That, that makes that ensures the superior individual, the entity, uh, uh, does a quality check on their employees. It's nothing new under the law. Respondent superior has been around forever. And it's the status quo in these cases as a matter of practice, is it not? That's correct. Ms. Gupta, anything to add? I've gone over 30 seconds, so keep it short. No, I agree. Okay. Thank you. I'll yield back the time I've gone over. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Senator Hawley, as you can tell, five minutes is subjective here. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to each of you for being here today. Uh, Pastor Logan, Professor Logan, if I could come back to you. Um, I'm just a little bit familiar with, uh, probably not as much as I should be, but with Epiphany Fellowship, both in Philly and in, and in Camden, and with Eric Mason, who I've had the great pl privilege of hearing preach many times, and with your ministry. So thank you for what you've, you've done in those places, and thank you for your continuing ministry. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask you to come back to your experience in Camden? And I've read your testimony, and at, at the risk of, of having you repeat yourself, but, but I don't think that would hopefully do anybody any harm. As you talk about... Uh, the the restructuring that you helped participate in there in Camden and police coming to your block, you say in two or small groups of two or three. And yeah, I love your line. You said our problems in Camden were not going to be solved overnight. We needed the slow cooker version. I wondered if you could just elaborate on, on that a little bit more for us. And you're, you were doing it with Senator Lee, but could you just pick that back up and talk to us about what that looked like in Camden, what you saw be successful there about building those relationships and what that meant? Yes, I would say it, I always talk about crockpot ministry. It takes a long time to work it through. It's not simple, um, especially when we're trying to change culture. Um, in the murder of George Floyd, he was training, an officer with 17 strikes was training other officers that day, which would have created, which we, we would have tra trained officers with a bad culture, which would have then blended into the culture and made added to the systemic issues already. And so if we're going to change something, we have to change culture. So the crockpot reality was listening and learning and then trying to legislate. The crockpot reality, the slow cooker, taking our time was not going to be just throw money at it. It wasn't going to be just grab 20 African Americans and 20 Latinos and call that diversity. Um, bootleg versions of patches, but it was going to take a collective overhaul and then, then a long build out. And um, I, I, I applaud the, um, all the government workers there in Camden who took their time and worked that through. And it, not only was it a comprehensive overhaul, but it was a collective overhaul because they called in people from all over the city to participate in that. And that took time. I mean, I was, Camden, I, we saw multiple murders. I did multiple funerals of kids under 15 um, on that. And then, on the other hand, felt very, very unsafe. And so all of us wanted to say, you got to fix this now. Um, but it was a crockpot repair. As you look back on that experience, what are the pieces that stick out to you as being the most significant, that, were, that made the most impact, that really moved the ball forward the most? I think it was the community policing where those conversations and those relationships were developed, um, where they were visible and active. I also, so that, that community policing was a big deal. And second was hearing from um, the residents and from multiple groups, particularly 
um, the pastors and different ones, and Mayor Red did good to um, pull in as many as she could in her time. So that relational community aspect was really a beautiful element that helped greatly. Very, very good. Can, can I ask you about something else you said in your, in your written testimony? Um, you talk about uh, the flaws of asking police to fix upstream problems. Your words. Could you just talk to us a little bit about your experience as a pastor, what you mean by upstream problems, and, and just maybe tell us more what you mean about that, because I think that, that seems like a significant point you're making there. Well, it's been said here on, on this committee that a police officer is given a task of social worker on the, on the second decision-making, and yes, it's difficult. He's a social worker. He's fixing. He's, he's dealing. He's trying to administer mercy. He's trying to do so much. Um, and I want to give credit to those officers who, who navigate that. But um, my colleague, Mr. Merritt, has told us that um, we fail miserably and we kill a lot of people in America through police and other countries haven't. So when we put... If my plumbing backs up, I'm not going to call an electrician because he's probably going to mess up my plumbing. So when we put plumbing problems on electricians, they mess up your plumbing. And so when we put so much on police that, and that's why the system is messed up because they shouldn't have to do that. And so the upstream problem is it's, it's difficult navigating and almost unfair. That's why we talk about the brokenness of the system. Okay, last question, Mr. Chairman. Can, Pastor, can you just give us a, a, an example? Give us an example of what you think of, of an upstream problem, you know, a plumbing problem that we're calling an electrician for just to help us get our, our, our hands around it. I'll use, um, I'll use a negative. Um, Mr. Brooks in Atlanta, um, he was... The officer showed up to ask him um, to talk with them. I felt that they were applying not just justice, but mercy. He was, ba he was saying, I can just walk home. And so now they're navigating a few areas. Are they supposed to do justice and lock him up? Are they supposed to do mercy and honor and say, look, I'm asleep, I can go home? And so in light of that, that is so much to juggle and handle. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a little emotional. I saw that video and it's been messing with my head even sitting here. But yeah, I think we over, we give too much to do for our officers and we don't train them properly. I think we need to parse this out and restructure completely because we need comprehensive change and radical intervention. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Add to that question. You bet. Absolutely. Um, what we're finding out is that no amounts of law enforcement, no amount of officers, no amount of use of force can secure a community that's stuck in poverty. No officers tell us we can't be the social workers, we can't be the mental and chemical health therapists, or we can't be the housing counselors and all of these other things that we need. They're telling us what our communities need from their perspective on the ground. And so, if we can find, as I was alluding to earlier, uh, again, $200 billion a year to pump into police and prisons, we can never find the resources uh, to raise the minimum wage, uh, to, to, to create the Section 8 waiting list, uh, and to provide those social workers and all of those other things that are actually telling us what they need. Well, then those are some of the upstream problems that officers are constantly trying to tell us that we need to address. That's why we're putting social workers in the call with people to connect people to stability, uh, to support, to solutions, instead of just creating deeper crisis when we find people who are in crisis. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Senator Clover Charles. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think I'll lead off with that, and I appreciate Mr. Logan's words and his emotion. Because um, I think we're all feeling that. Um, Mayor Carter, it was hard to hear parts of your story, but just so my colleagues can hear it, um, you were talking about how your grandpa 
uh, Melvin Sr. worked at that railroad in Minnesota and how uh, he was called George. In fact, all the porters were called George uh, so that the white passengers only had to hear one name. And then out of that and learn one name, your dad becomes uh, one of the first African-American police officers um, in the city of St. Paul. And you talked about how you thought about your dad, and I know still do, and the people around him, the officers he knew as superheroes. And I guess my question is how you talk to those police officers now, some of whom you knew growing up, about why it is so important uh, to have this systemic change uh, with policing from your personal experience. Senator, thank you for the question. And I think that's really important to know. Uh, our officers uh, are just as disgusted by the video of George Floyd's murder. I had one officer recently say to me, you know, I signed up for a dangerous job, but with the notion that I can be hurt because someone's upset about something that some other officer did in some other jurisdiction, that makes me frustrated. Uh, and so we are connected with our officers and that they know that those instances don't serve them well, and they don't want to serve next to those officers, and they're frustrated with the road. And not get my children, all of our children deserve to be able to look at our offices as those superheroes in the way uh, that I did growing up. That's one of the reasons why it's so important, as you mentioned, Senator, we uh, constantly integrate our officers into our community. That we're working, we have established uh, under Chief Axel, our police chief, uh, we've significantly grown our community engagement division in our police department. We've established those uh, initiatives that I mentioned earlier to ensure that we're providing pathways for new people to grow up in our city, to uh, go to our public schools, uh, to become uh, officers and to serve the city both as officers, as paramedics, as EMTs, and as firefighters. Uh, that is, it, is critical. They're out at our communities, as you are, you've seen them, Senator. They're out at our communities. They're engaging with people on a direct basis. So that their only engagement with people isn't just, there's something wrong and I'm here to arrest you. Uh, we talk to our officers all the time about that. It's a part of our training. Uh, it's a part of our mission. And our chief always asks folks uh, as we talk, about, as we uh, go about the work, uh, in the words of our chief, of uh, putting deposits into our bank of trust before we ever have to make it a Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask Ms. Gupta a question, but I'll have you follow up on the record. I know you were, Senator Graham was asking you about other police departments, or you were responding to his question about Minneapolis, and I I think you were trying to make the point that uh, this is happening uh, all over the country and it's not just in one department. So I want to give you a chance on the record later uh, to answer that. But I'm going to turn my remaining time uh, to Ms. Gupta. And I think you know, uh, Ms. Gupta, that um, I led a letter with about 26 senators asking for a pattern and practice investigation from Attorney General Barr of the Minneapolis Police Department. And do you think that such a pattern and practice investigation uh, is needed? Yes. Yes, I do. And I don't know if you're aware, but right before this hearing started, um, and we've done two letters now, a group of us. Uh, I got a response, and it was from uh, Mr. Boyd, uh, the Assistant Attorney General. And they did not commit to doing this investigation. Uh, they said they, the section may initiate a civil action in the name of the United States. Um, and seek appropriate injusti uh, injunctive relief. Uh, we will carefully consider the evidence in this case, as well as any additional information that comes to our attention. Uh, do you think there is enough information now out there that the whole world has seen to embark on this investigation? I think the years of um, systemic problems in the Minneapolis Police Department, coupled with, of course, uh, George Floyd's most recent the, the most recent killing of Mr. Floyd and other um, uh, police misconduct in Minneapolis by the police department would merit a pattern and practice investigation. There's a pretty abundant amount of evidence. And I also know that some of the uh, consent decrees when you led the Justice Department Civil Rights Division um, re actually required police departments to ban the use of choke holds and other neck restraints. Is that right? That's right. So that's one of the examples of something that could come out of a consent decree that was a result of a pattern and practice investigation. Yes. 
And then um, in our state now, because we have not been able to have that Justice Department pattern and practice investigation, um, in addition to Attorney General's investigation, Attorney General Ellison of the case and his prosecution of the case, uh, we now have our Minnesota Department of Human Rights stepping in uh, to look at the department. And uh, Senator Harris was uh, talking about the importance of having outside investigations, uh, which I strongly supported uh, when I was a prosecutor. We had some issues, as you may know, with the Minneapolis police um, trying to take those investigations in-house. But in addition to that, um, states, especially now, if the Justice Department isn't doing pattern and practice, could step in um, to actually oversee these investigations, but as well as oversee a, a similar version of a pattern and practice. Could you address that? Yeah, I mean, I think both, um, just to get to your earlier point about chokeholds, consent decrees covered, in many instances, bans on chokeholds. They are not a substitute for national legislation on this issue, because otherwise it's just kind of jurisdiction to jurisdiction in the Justice Department, even when functioning uh, uh, you know, according to its mandate, um, can't meet all of that. So national legislation is, is required. And then on this other point, on state AGs and um, other independent offices being able to do these investigations, uh, it's really important that there are prosecutors and state uh, AGs offices that are empowered to be able to take these issues on. They are going to have more trust than local DA's offices. It's just the nature of this, given the close relationship between district attorney's offices and police departments. Uh, and so while I want the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Justice Department that is filled with expertise to be fully funded and resourced and be given the, the authority that it, that it um, needs to have, it is also really important to be able to equip state attorneys general and independent Dependent offices to do this as well. Thank you very much. Senator Cruz. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this hearing. Thank you for each of the witnesses for coming. You know, this is a time when our country is torn apart, is filled with anger, is filled with rage, is filled with division. And it is my hope that through this, we can find ways to come together on shared principles. Here's one proposition I believe everyone in this hearing room agrees with. What happened to George Floyd was horrific. It was unconscionable. It was clearly a grotesque abuse of police power. And the officers that carried it out are rightly being prosecuted. To the best of my knowledge, Every witness here today agrees with those statements. And every senator on this committee agrees with those statements. I think all of us, regardless of party, should demand justice. And should demand that the law be applied fairly. You were just watching the Senate Judiciary Committee's hearing on policing and community relations. You can keep streaming it at cbsnews.com forward slash hearing. For now, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more on the hearing on Red and Blue. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do we have the capacity to deal with what is coming? Face the questions you want answered. Are, Are you looking at a bailout? Can you walk the American people through what happens next? Are you saying you did not ever hear of such a deal? Do you need to level with the American people? Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. 
I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Sinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. On Tuesday, nearly a dozen witnesses testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee during a hearing on police reform. The witness list included experts with backgrounds in civil rights and law enforcement. Senators on both sides of the aisle discussed the need to fix what they said was a broken system. I've never been stopped. And when I see a cop behind me, the first thing I think about is, what did I do wrong, and can I talk myself out of this ticket? There's literally no fear. And I wouldn't like to live in a country where I'd be afraid to be stopped. So hopefully we can all understand that problem and fix it. But it is a problem. Every black man in America, virtually every black man in America, feels like if they get stopped by the cop, it's a traumatic experience. The stakes right now are high. Will we meet this moment in history and actually do something real, or will we find ourselves back here again a year from now, three years